I'm not always there when you call, but I am always on time. This is the punch needle that I use. The brand is called Milwa. It's a very standard and basic build for a punch needle. It has a wood body and it's completely hollow so that you can put your thread through and it has a metal punch with a large hole. This is a size 10 punch needle and it makes quarter inch loops, which means that the loops for the wall on the other side will be a quarter inch in length. This sort of punch needle is best for work that isn't very detailed, blurs out details a lot. However, it's a good standard and it comes with two different sizes in the pack. I would usually use it with this type of wool. It's a two ply wool. It's also quite large and fluffy and the diameter of the wool is about the same size as the hole. To use it, you just put the filament through to the other end. It gives you lots of room here. Put the hole through the middle, drag it out. And then you're ready to start using your punch needle. To use the needle, you just go in, pull the string from the opposite side, and then go in the direction that the open hole of the punch needle is facing. When you finish making the line, all you need to do is take the thread from the other side, clip it, remove the punch, and then you're left with your texture. Just cut off the excess. This is what the loops look like for this size punch needle. I've left a link in the description to the exact punch needle that I'm using. However, if it's not available where you are or if it's out of stock, any punch needle with this basic build will do. This punch needle is from the same brand, Millwall, but the difference with this is that it's made from plastic and it's adjustable. So these small numbers here indicate how long the stitch loop is going to be. Just give it a simple turn and move back and that will give you a shorter loop and then that's the longest loop. This type of punch needle comes with multiple different heads. However, all of them are much smaller than the traditional punch needle. So you're gonna have to use a smaller thread for this one. With this punch needle, I used another two ply. However, the difference is this one isn't as fluffy and the actual string itself is much thinner. The process of threading this punch needle is the same. However, you're going to remove the base <laughs> clumsily. This just makes it easier for the filament to go through. To thread this once again, you're just gonna go through the hole in the back with the filament. Making sure that it's gone through the long hole. Take it to the very end. You've still got a lot of room with this one as well. Then I also just putting the cap back on. Then you take your wool and pull it through like you did with the other punch needle. I'm gonna start on number 12, which is the highest, so you can see what the long loops look like. This is what the loops look like on the opposite side. As you can see, because it's a thinner yarn, it's giving me a much thinner line, even though I've done the same amount of punches. However, the height of them is exactly the same. So now I'm gonna do the same thing again, but on the smallest level. This is what the loops look like on the other side. As you can see, that looks horrible. Even though I did the loops quite close together, they are still quite sparse. Not having the extra length has really shown the distance between them. I wouldn't suggest ever going this low unless you're really talented and can do very small detailed work. This is the other main punch needle that I'm gonna be using for this project. The brand for this one is Rico Design. Once again, this is a plastic punch with a metal tip, but this one actually has a larger hole so I can use my larger thread and the smaller one. The threading process is the same. However, I found because it's such a long punch, it doesn't give you very much left of the hook on the end. The disadvantage of this mean that it's a lot harder to actually get the wall through, especially if it's fluffy like this. See, even though that's quite rough, I have found though that you can still pull that through, which ultimately is the result that you want. We can trim this and pretend that that never happened. So I'm gonna start on the highest setting for this one, which is A. So this should give me a mega long loop in comparison. Using a loop of this side is 
super awkward because I've never actually used this setting before. However, I'm very interested to see how the other side is going to look. As you can see on the other side, this made massive loops, which I think would be really good if you're doing something very textural and if you want to do a large surface area in a short amount of time. But for detailed work, it's definitely a no-no. And finally, I'm going to do it on the smaller setting again. And this is what the loops look like on the smaller setting. So in conclusion, I think depending on what kind of project you're working on, the regular wooden punch needle is gonna be your best option. If you're trying to do something a little bit more advanced and you want a bit more freedom with what you're doing, I would suggest the Rico design because it gives you both the longest loops and the smallest loops that are still usable. You can use bigger and smaller threads and the smallest loop still looks clean. Hi friends. Welcome back to the Inspiration Zone. A part of my creative process is always to have a mood board of stuff that I can go back to and always reference to know why I'm making the decisions that I'm making and also to give my creativity some framework. So I've broken it down this time into three different sections. Color, theme, and style. So for the color, I've been really inspired by the Night Blazer mids. There's a green version, which I really like. It's got a green suede on the outside and then like a teal on the inside. I follow a guy called Danny the Die Dog. He does these rubber dip sneakers that are really sick and he actually took the same colorway that I'm gonna use for my color reference and he did just a mad mashup of it. I find it just super inspiring. I know that you guys really like the rings that I always wear and I'm actually trying to figure out a way to get a few made on this YouTube channel. I'm also working with a team at Sweda. They're an Indonesian company and we've been talking back and forth just about things that we can do. One of the ideas that we came up with was working in some mythology. One of the creatures that we spoke about was called the Kinari. It's a very beloved mythical creature in Buddhism and it comprises of a third human, a third horse and a third bird. You guys know that I've been very inspired recently by traditional animal rugs. So I kind of wanted to take that same motif, add it to the design of the Kinari and then use the colors from the blazer to make a brand new design. By the way, that's the same process that I use for designing the clothes for my clothing brand. This is a piece that just dropped. We just sold out a lot of stuff, which I'm super grateful for. Thank you. But I've also opened pre-orders for this and some of other stock. So if you want to go over to corygold.com and pick you up a piece. And now let's move on to the sketching stage. Usually when I'm sketching, I'll start off with a pencil, just a really light graphite, just cause you tend to make a few mistakes once you're first starting and then I'll go in with a black pen after. The goal of this right now is to make sure that I'm getting in all of the details which I outlined, which are characteristic of Canary. So we wanna make sure that there's human characteristics in the face. Also a lot of bird characteristics. I use a lot of feathers. I think that will look really great with the texture of the wool. And then I used a saddle around the waist to represent the horse detail because I didn't want to do too much of that. I was really enjoying the bird motif. I just want to move a bit of shading and then when that's all done, we're going to go on to the digital stage making a vector. I've scanned the rough sketch that I made into Adobe Illustrator and I know that I want to use the Night Blazer as the inspiration for the colors. So I've gone on Amazon and I've found wool that corresponds to the colors of the blazer. So now I need to add these colors to the design. I'm going to use the eyedropper tool and I'm going to hover it across this wool swatch while holding down the left cursor on the mouse. And as you can see, as I'm moving around the mouse, the colors in the swatch is changing. This is because it wants to pick up the color that's directly underneath the dropper. Once I've selected the color that I like, I'm going to go over and make a new color group. I'm going to name it Rug because I have no imagination and I'm going to pull the color down into the new section. I'm going to do the same with the gray, the teal and the cream. Now that I have my new color group selected, I'm going to go over to my direct selection tool and pick an element, which color I wanna change. I'm gonna go to select, same fill color. And I'm gonna press the teal, which changes everything that I wanna change to that color. And once again, I'm gonna do the same thing with the cream, the gray, and with the emerald green. And now that this is done, I can now transfer this image onto the monk's cloth to make the rug. This is the frame that I normally use to make my rugs. It's a canvas 
that I've literally cut the middle strip of wood out of and I've also taken off the canvas fabric. It's really simple for someone who doesn't want to do any sort of construction or doesn't have tools. However, for this project that I'm doing, I'm doing about two rugs. So I could go out and buy two more canvases. However, it makes a bit more sense for me to just make a giant one. I cut four pieces of wood. Two of them were 60 inches, two of them were 40 inches. And I use these angle brackets along with my power drill just to attach them together. And just to make sure it was a bit more supported, I use these straight ones as well. And this is what the frame looks like when it's completely finished. Super simple. The nails that I used to fasten the wood together were just a little bit longer than the thickness of the wood. This was actually a mistake. I'm not gonna pretend like I did it on purpose. However, it works well because the fabric that I'm using for this is called monk's cloth and it needs to be fastened to the wood and having these little hooks there actually makes it easier. And then just to make sure that I don't hurt myself, I got these foam strips from Amazon. They have an adhesive back and all I need to do is peel off, stick that down and hopefully no one will get hurt. So to fasten the rest of this together, I'm just gonna take a staple gun. I'm going to staple at the very edge of the wood at this part. The more fabric that I have between the staple and the edge of the fabric, the easier it will be for the monk's cloth to hold onto this. I'm doing these staples about two inches apart from each other. You don't need them to be any closer than that, to be honest. So make sure that you've got an equal distance between all of these. In the previous video, I did a tutorial about if you don't have a projector or any sort of transferring tools, how you can use a regular printer to make a pattern and then use scissors just to cut it out and transfer it to the monk's cloth. But for this video, I've decided to actually use a projector. This is the Jinho. I would not recommend it at all. <laughs> It's very loud. The quality isn't very good in low light, but it works for this purpose. I think if you want a projector solely for art projects, it will work. But even so, the quality of the lighting, even in a dark room, isn't the best. However, it did allow me to get this nice and clean image that I can now use the punch needle on. So one of the goals of this channel and a lot of the things that I'm doing on it is to make everything that I'm doing as approachable as possible. And I don't want anyone to be intimidated by maybe thinking that there's a certain skill level or a threshold to doing punch needle work. I'm actually holding the camera with one hand right now and I'm punching with the other. So what I'm doing is I'm holding my pinky finger down on the fabric and I'm pushing in and I'm using my pinky finger as leverage and I'm going up and down. So I'm keeping most of my hands still. The only thing that's raising is my thumb. So I'll go up with the thumb and in. Always making sure that I'm not raising too high so that we don't get too many loops all the way over and to the end. And with smaller lines like this, because this is going to be a very thin line of just one row of loops. So you want to make sure that you're punching quite close together just so that on the other side, the loops form a straight line. And if it gives you a bit of trouble like that just did, don't worry about it. The fabric will hold up. You can actually use your other hand if you just follow along the line. I'm gonna do the same thing, lift up, with my thumb, and then down. Up, and then down. And you can just do that going all the way across, like I said, because it's lifting up. I'm gonna just make sure that my pinky is holding down the fabric. And we're going across. If you're having trouble finding that your loops aren't staying in properly, or that they end up looking kind of loose on this side, which obviously is going to be the back side. Once you get to the end of where you want to be, all you need to do is go to the other side and just pull down on your loops. Light pressure, nothing too crazy. You don't want to damage anything. 
but if you just pull it down, it gets a bit tighter. You'll find that as you start to build up, this doesn't have the added advantage at this stage of having multiple loops to hold it together. So when it's a thin line, you can pull it, but when you get to sections like this, where you've done a whole bunch together, the tension of the fabric will start to hold the loops in better and you won't have to worry about pulling them through. So more than likely you guys aren't actually gonna have to just use one hand. So what I would suggest is if you have two is to just lay it down on the fabric so you've got a little bit of tension. You can literally move a lot faster. Sometimes it wants to fight you, <laughs> especially when you're doing an explanation, but then you can move a lot faster because the tension's been done with this hand here. One of the biggest struggles that you're gonna have when you're doing a punch needle is making sure that the loops stay in. The easiest way to make sure that, that happens is to have lots of thread left over so that as you punch in, it's not catching. So the best thing you can do is just grab a whole bunch of your thread and pull it out. You don't want them all to be in one place because what happens is just like headphones, as soon as they touch each other, they turn into nuts <laughs> like it's madness. And that's ideally how you want the thing to look. So using this small section here as an example, I need to get this all filled in, but I wanna do it one time with one stroke. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna go up here, down, back up, down, around, to the middle, out, in, and then back where I started. Cutting off the flyaways is definitely the most satisfying part of doing this. I'm not sure why that is. I think it's just because you put in a lot of work and you don't really see how the other side looks. And then when you turn it over, there's all of this, like it's just a mess around it, which kind of just doesn't make it look how you envisioned it. But then as soon as you cut these away, it starts to reveal all of the hard work that you've been doing for the past few days. <laughs> and it is a nice feeling to look at something that you're actually putting a lot of effort into and have it slowly be revealed to you even though you're the person that made it. This is a brand new design and I'm always worried about brand new designs just because I don't know how it will turn out. And there was a lot of detail in this, but it did turn out way better than I'd hoped. So I saved this cream for the face for last. And the reason I did that is because I'm using a wool color that is basically the same as the Monts cloth. The reason that that can be an issue is because it makes it very easy for me to, if I was to go across and accidentally miss some space, it becomes harder to see just because the colors are so uniform. All the wool is on at this point. So the next thing that we want to do is make sure that we can get this to hang on the wall. These are damage free hanging strips. They look like this when you take them out of the pack. The idea is you take them apart and then press both sides together. So now that's locked in. And the idea is that one side would go on the wall and it's an easy peel off so it doesn't damage the wall. And the other side would go on what you wanna hang. Just for a bit of extra protection though, I'm actually going to glue the back of this because if it was a hard surface, there'd be no problem with doing this. And usually this won't pull out. So I normally wouldn't put any glue on it. If you're laying a rug on the floor, there's no reason to have glue on it because there wouldn't be anything pulling on it. But if this is on the wall, it's naturally going to be pulling on the most delicate part. So this time I'm actually going to apply glue. So this is just a basic white PVA glue that I got from the store. And I'm just gonna apply it with a regular this spatula. So I'm applying this really generously to the back and then just spreading it across. So while the glue is still wet, I'm just going to remove one side of this.
to finish the rug I usually do a whip stitch all across the edge this just kind of cleans up the edge of it and it just stops it from having a frayed look on the side if I was just to cut it and leave it like this it would look a bit unprofessional and kind of janky so I've just taken two arms length of thread what I usually do is just go in straight and then I'll leave a bit of excess I'm gonna go from right to left because I'm right-handed but I'm gonna go from left to right so start going in and then I'm gonna leave about half an inch left here and then I'm gonna come back out this way I'm gonna hold this down just so it doesn't come out and then like that and then from there I'm gonna go in and do my regular whip stitch 